Welcome to another episode of our Founders Podcast. I'm your host, Ash, and this is a show where I interview proven founders and industry experts who share their stories, strategies, and insights to help you build, launch, and grow your business. In this episode, I talk to Vicky, the product creation and Amazon sales expert. Vicky Winberg, an expert in product creation, specializing in helping small businesses thrive on the e-commerce giant. With a background in corporate roles, Vicky founded Tiny Chipmunk, a bamboo baby brand, to balance family life and entrepreneurship. But that has been in history. Vicky offered invaluable support for product creation and excels in Amazon sales. She she is also the host of a Bring Your Product Idea to Life podcast, catering to product-based entrepreneurs. Vicky is your go-to resource for product creation, Amazon selling, and building a family-friendly business. So I hope you enjoy the show. Vicky, welcome to the show. Well, oh, hi, Ash. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Do you have a favorite quote, something that inspires or motivates you that you would like to share with us? Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know how inspiring it will be, but my favorite quote, and has been for a while, is done is better than perfect. And what mm-hmm. I mean by this is um, not that I don't do excellent work for my clients of course I do any work I do for my clients has to be perfect but I feel like especially in the early days of my business I let the pursuit of perfect hold me back in so many ways Um, for example building a website posting on social media Um, I think I spent too long wanting everything to be just right before Mm. I would do anything and of course procrastination just wastes time and I got to the point where I thought, do you know, it's better to try and it may only be 80% and everything can be improved upon rather than, you know, spending all this time um, procrastinating and tweaking things that really don't make so much of a difference in the bigger scheme of things. And I think that's quite good advice, hopefully, for anyone who is overthinking. Sometimes it's better to perhaps make a decision and go with it and know that nothing is permanent. Indeed, indeed, and I, I can't, I can't uh, express, uh, I can't put a more, more pressure on this. That I have heard this in so many web series. It just focus for startups, saying execution is the king, not the idea. Idea has its own benefits, but execution is what makes it real. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so let's talk about where your story has begun where did you got into this spirit of entrepreneurship helping other businesses and helping other founders and entrepreneurs um what actually seeded the seed in in, into the space to get you here so if i go quite a long way back and you will have to tell me if i'm going too far is that um before i had my first child was born i worked in corporate role i worked for a big oil and gas company for a long time um and then after my first child, my son was born, I didn't want to go back to the corporate world. And I I sort of felt that the only way I would be able to work around my family was to do something for myself. Um, so I set up my own business. At the time, um, I was a yoga teacher. So I was teaching yoga um, because it felt like something I could pick my hours. I could choose when I did my classes. I could make sure I had childcare for my son I could recruit a team to also deliver classes so it wasn't always me and that was the first sort of my step into doing something completely on my own which was very scary um I did that for a couple of years and then after my second child was born which was three years later um I had some physical problems during the pregnancy which meant I couldn't actually teach the classes so while I still ran the business luckily as I say I had a team so the business could continue um but Personally, I I couldn't do any of the thing that I loved, which was interacting with people and teaching the classes. Um, I felt like I was then just doing the admin and perhaps the bits I wasn't enjoying so much. And I came up with the idea around that time, it was actually just after my second child was born, that I would like to have a go at creating my own product to sell. I actually was listening to a podcast um, and the host was interviewing two people who had their own products business and they were talking about the lifestyle they had. And while the lifestyle they were talking about was they were spending lots of their time working by swimming pools and traveling around the world, that, that wasn't what I wanted. But what I took from that is there was a lot of freedom that mm. while I, the business I created for myself worked in the sense I worked for myself, 
there still wasn't quite the same freedom because I was delivering classes. So I had to be at a set place at a set time that I committed to. And mm. there were still more constraints that I felt when I had two young children. I thought, actually, this is hard. Um, and plus not being able to work during my pregnancy, I thought, actually, if I have a business selling products and I set things up so that things are automated and a lot of the processes are outsourced, it felt like a business that I could work on but sometimes step away from and things would still continue to run. Mm. Um, yeah, so that is what I did. Great, great. So so when you had this epiphany, did and I'm sure there were lots of other people because you were listening to the podcast of this person who, who was sharing their lifestyle, etc. What what kind of research you did and what exactly encouraged you to move ahead with the idea? I mean, obviously you were motivated by listening to the stories of these other founders, but what was the trigger which said to you, no, Vicky, you have to do it? I think it was when I came up with the idea for the product. So when I had this idea that I would like to sell products, I had all these ideas in my head because I was running a yoga business. I was thinking, oh, do I sell yoga products or, and I was active wear and I was looking at different options and, and, but nothing really spoke to me. Nothing compelled me enough to actually do it. The catalyst for actually starting the business was I was looking for um, products for my new baby and I couldn't find what I wanted. So the, the first one of the, so for example, one of the things I was looking at was towels. So hooded towels that you put on a baby when they come out of the bath. Mm -hmm. And I was getting out the things I'd use for my first child. And I realized they were all very small. They were quite hard. They didn't feel like something I wanted to wrap a tiny baby in. So I went on Amazon and I looked to buy something and what I looked for just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And th I think that was the moment when I thought, okay so no one else is doing this no one else is doing exactly what I wanted so my products were made of bamboo they had no chemicals in them they were very pure for a new baby and at the time there wasn't anything quite like that on the market there were a few products but they were priced quite expensive so I thought well if I can do something similar um but maybe with a slightly lower price point to make it a bit more accessible. At the, that time, no one else is doing that. And that gave me the catalyst because I thought, okay, I can solve a real problem. I can't be the only parent feeling, you know, looking for these types of products, not finding them. Mm -hmm. um, there clearly is a demand because, as I said, there was a product at the time that was selling very well. That was It was very well-established brand, but it was a lot more expensive. So I thought, actually, I feel like there is a gap in the market here and, I feel like I should do it. And of course, there was also that thing where I thought I want to do it before somebody else does. Mm -hmm. Because when I look now, um, my product today wouldn't be unique. Today, mm -hmm. there would be so much competition. Um, and, you know, it, I'm, I'm not saying it wouldn't be worth it, but I'm not sure if I was thinking of that product idea today, I would go ahead because I think that there, there, there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't that gap in the market that there was um, how many years, eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of things have been changed in the last eight years, especially in the e-commerce space. So I can I can totally imagine that. So <clears throat> so then afterwards, when you decided to launch this product, did you go forward with it? Did you do something about it? Or yeah, so as soon as I had the idea, I'm I am the sort of person who, when I have an idea and I'm committed to it, I'm very good at action. <laughs> I'm very good at going. Okay, I've decided. Let's make this happen. Um, and I was very motivated. And so say I had a young family, but, uh, you know, I was lucky I was able to work around them when they were sleeping. And I spent a lot of time on Google and on YouTube trying to figure out, okay, so I've got this idea. Now, now what? How do I go from idea to physical product? Yeah. Um, and I did a lot of, a lot of research. Um yeah, it was. It's, I think I can't even overemphasize the amount of research that I did, and that for me was key. So research into what I needed to do, um, mm. which was very helpful. Although I will say that I went through quite a lot of rabbit holes and spent a bit too much time on things that, in the whole scheme of things, maybe mm. didn't matter so much. Um, and that's kind of what led me to the business I have today, which we can talk about more later. Um, but I also did a lot of research to make sure that my idea was viable. Before I was, so while I was going ahead with it, 
I also knew, you know, it was a risk. The thing with launching a product is that often, well, most times if it's a physical product, there is some sort of initial investment you need to make. So you need to put some money down to have your product manufactured. Or even if it's something you're making yourself, you obviously need ingredients, components, whatever. So because I knew I was putting money into this, my own money, I had to be really sure that I was going to see that money back. Yeah, um, yeah. And I can't overemphasize how important that is if you have an idea for a product to do your research and make sure that the product is viable before you spend lots of time and money on it. Because I think that would be so disheartening um, to come up with something, to put all the work in, all of the money, and then realize actually, just, you know, no one's buying this. Mm-hmm. So which way this went ahead then? So you launched a product, would you be able to share some numbers, how much you invested initially, what kind of time you spent, because that is also a lot of effort and you know, resources. Where did it went from there? Did you succeed to make uh, your return on investment or maybe profits on top of it or other way around? And then what was the learning from it? Sure. So yeah, so I, in terms of time, I think it took about six months from having the idea to having a product actually for sale. And I sold my products on my own website, which was a Shopify site because I found for e-commerce and I still think for e-commerce Shopify is a very good option because it was very simple and all of the functionality was built in. So the checkout and everything like that. So I think that was really helpful. Um, And I also set up on Amazon because as I mentioned I'd known from my research that there wasn't a product quite like mine on Amazon at the time so within six months I was listed on Amazon and on my own website and what I found really interesting was that um and I suppose it does make sense now is I, I, I did a lot of work. I just think this is maybe useful for people to, to hear is I spent a lot of work trying to get people on my website. I did Google ads. I, um, I, I'd had a blog that I was updating regularly. I was posting on social media. But despite all of this effort, 90% of my sales came from Amazon. Mm. Um, my first batch of products sold out very quickly I then placed another order and then expanded on the product range from there Mm. um so I and I mentioned that because I think it's very interesting I I assumed I would make more money more sales on my website um and in hindsight I don't know why I thought that because of course Amazon is this you know remember these days I didn't know so much about Amazon and it is a shopping site and it does make sense that people would would buy on there Um, but I think one thing I learned is I was, I was spent making a lot of effort to try and get people onto my website. Whereas I feel that actually it took me too long to go, do you know what? 90% of people are buying from me on Amazon rather than trying to convert them to buy my website. Does it matter where they make the purchase? Not really. Um, and I should have put more focus into what was working rather than what wasn't working so I think that is a is a key learning really that I think I in my head I had this idea of how I wanted the business to be you know I wanted to sell everything through my site mm. but in reality it, it didn't yeah. matter I was making the sales I was making profit it shouldn't have mattered so much to me where those sales were coming from and I don't know why I resisted it I can't I I haven't learned that I'm not sure exactly why I resisted it but I did and for too long and I probably held myself back a little bit because of that yeah yeah and and and, you know it's like 80 20 rule where it's like 20 percent is bringing you like 80 percent of result and you have to focus on that and to be to be fair People tend to, in, even myself, we, we tend to buy from Amazon because there's two very specific emotional or, or emotional attachments we have. Ease of use, because all of our details are there. We just have to click, click, and click. Trust. We trust Amazon that if something goes wrong, some the product is wrong, they will take it back and we get our money back. That's why people hesitate to buy it from other website compared. If I want to buy something, even if that product is not available on Amazon, when I search on Google, I go back on Amazon and search multiple times before buying it for half price from outside Amazon. Because I know if the product is wrong, I get full refund. So that's Um, kind of trust thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I'm such a big advocate, as I'm sure we'll talk about, of businesses 
being on Amazon because I think it's a much easier purchase than an unknown website that perhaps you've never heard of. You might feel a bit um, worried about putting your credit card details in, for example, whereas yeah. with Amazon, you have that trust as well that they're not going to steal your money. Your order will be delivered. And if not, and there are problems, as you say, it will get fixed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so I want to go back and uh, learn more about your roots, your uh, your experiences, how it got shaped, it shaped your journey, and eventually you became the the entrepreneur and coach uh, today. But before that, would you be able to uh, share with our listeners about uh, percentage wise how much you've grown your business by selling this product on Amazon, and then after that, why did you stop? If you have stopped. Sure. So I, yeah, my business grew and grew. I, in the end, I think I had 20 SKUs that I was selling on, as I say, mainly through Amazon. Um, and the business was doing, yeah, was doing very well. Um, but yet, yeah, you know, as we know, I stopped. Um, and so I need to go back a little bit to get to that, if that's okay, which is so when I first set up this business, I launched a blog at the same time. So not a blog for Tiny Chipmunk, but a blog which was about me sharing what I was doing, what I was learning about creating a product from scratch. Because I had in the back of my mind, maybe someone will find this useful one day because I was learning a lot I was making mistakes and I thought you know even if one person comes to this blog and realizes oh I need an EORI number for importing for example which is something I didn't know I thought it's helpful so I started that blog up and as a result I was getting people contacting me and saying oh I, I've got an idea for a product but I have this question or I don't know where to start and I was getting not not loads but more than I ever thought people contacted me asking for help mm. and then as I started talking more about Amazon and what I was learning there I was getting more Amazon specific questions and people coming and saying oh I'd really like to be on Amazon but I can't work out the system and can you help me and I was giving advice and support and I was in lots of networking groups and I, I became quite known as the person to ask for this mm. so and this continued and then we came into the pandemic at the beginning of 2020 and things really shifted for me. So my products, Chinese Chipmunk products, were selling really well. Um, I don't know if you remember back, back then, but on Amazon at the time, only certain product categories were allowed to send their products into Amazon for fulfillment which was how I ran my business because as I said I wanted to be quite hands-off when it came to certain aspects of the business because I had a young family so I'd outsourced all my fulfillment um, but only yeah only certain product categories so health products baby products there were only certain things that could be sent into Amazon and selling baby products meant I could um, and obviously everyone's at home so online sales as you know went up and so that meant two things one was that my product sales went up even more so 2020 you know, it was a really good sales time for me. Um, but that presented some challenges in that my supplier at the time was in China. Well, I had a few different suppliers. They were all my manufacturers were in China. I was in the process of moving manufacturing to Portugal. So at the end of 2019, I'd started that process. Um, both the manufacturers in China and the manufacturers I was speaking to in Portugal shut down for quite an extended period of time yeah. which meant that I had no stock to replenish mm -hmm. and then at the same time lots more businesses were wanting to get onto Amazon because they could see the opportunity and so suddenly I was so busy um, with with that with supporting other entrepreneurs to launch on Amazon mm -hmm. um, and that became I want to say for the pandemic obviously started in March, but throughout the whole of that year, my business really took off and I was spending so much of my time on consulting and coaching other business owners. Um, I was eventually able to order some more stock for my Chinese manufacturer because the one I had in Portugal that I'd been speaking with just sort of disappeared. I don't know if they ever reopened, but that stopped. So I went back to my original manufacturer yeah. and sort of managed to pay some orders. Um, but then there were lots of shipping delays into the UK. So my stock was sat in a container for quite a long time. Um, and then I had an issue at customs, which wasn't me. It was just somebody I was in the same container with. Their stock got 
held, so my stock got held. So I was out of stock for a long time. And then I, then I was finally selling again. But the, that whole thing had been so, if I'm honest, had been so stressful, um, you know, being out of stock and trying to manage pre-orders and customers wanting to know when can I have this? And it, I found it really, really stressful. And as I said, because the consultancy part of my business had kind of completely by accident, I hadn't really planned it to go that way, really taken off. And I was so busy with that. I started to ask myself, okay, can I realistically manage both? Because I still have, I still had and have a young family. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I felt, okay, can I, can I do everything? And um, I made the decision at the beginning of 2021 that I would close Tiny Chipmunk and would focus on supporting other small businesses. Um, and if yeah, and if I'm really honest about why I think it was partly because I felt burnt out by the stress of, you know, the, the previous year. And also I was really enjoying, I think after years of working on my own, so having this product business and it's just being me um everything was outsourced but you know external it wasn't like I had someone working with me packing orders for example that was all done remotely I did feel a bit isolated and I'd really enjoyed working with other people I really liked adding value to other businesses and I realized that I think that suited me much more I working in isolation wasn't something for me um yeah. So it was a hard decision, but <clears throat> I'm pleased that it made it. Great, great. So, so, so let let's move to the next part um, of your your life. Then, when you started the consulting, but before that, quick question: What was the percentage of profit or um, ROI you made on Tiny Chip Month? Just for our listeners, was it like you spent hundred pounds and you made hundred twenty for overall business, like twenty percent? Just for the understanding, because I don't know anything about Amazon, how much percentage of profit you can say. So my margin is probably the easiest thing. So I think anyone interested in product will speak on margins. My margin was around 30%. On average, it varied for each of my products. As I mentioned I had quite a big range, but on average, it was around 30%. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say if you have like, you know, accounting costs or other costs, so we can split it into half. So you made 15% profit. Okay, so that's that's a good margin compared to retail store and restaurant because I have few friends who have restaurants in central London and their margins are approximately 20-25%, but it's too much effort to make that much profit. So compared to that, this is better uh, revenue model. Okay, yeah, so let's move think... to the... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, and when it comes to, to Amazon as well, I should also say that, so that was actually my margin after all the Amazon fees and everything else. Um, and I right. should also say that I think depending on the product you're selling and the product price, um, there still is possibility on Amazon to make a good margin. So mm-hmm. I know some people think, okay, I'll make more money on my website. And for some people that is the case because obviously there's so many factors, but um, there, there definitely still is the potential for margin even today i know things have changed fees go up but that possibility is still there sure sure okay so i'm guessing that when you started this journey you started this blog to to share with the world the story of how you began what kind of strategy the research you were doing and while you were posting all this um uh, journey uh, uh, content about your journey people started contacting you that means they wanted help from you and 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 you realize that okay if you're not going through tiny chip more then let's do the consulting part of it or being a coach in the in the um, in the space and obviously you have gone through the whole pain so you understand much more than the person who hasn't even started yet so it's a good opportunity for you so what was the how how did you started it did you put a consulting or a coaching um, website up or was it just through the social media or was it your blog which bring you more customers and what kind of revenue model you used in order to run this coaching business? So originally it was people contacting me through the blog or through networking. So at the at the time I was a member of lots of networking groups, some in person, some virtual Um which I think was good for me because it meant I built up quite a lot of contacts, which was useful. And I would get people referring me. So someone might say, Oh, I, I need help with this. And I think 
there are other people who do what I do um, but it's still fairly niche enough that I sometimes will come to mind if someone asks so that's really helpful um, because I did used to talk to people about what I do and I think that's you know it's it's really good to tell people what you do is the advice I would give because you never know who who knows somebody um, and so it's always really useful if people know actually what you do so if they find someone who's a good fit they can refer you um so that's how it really started when I decided okay I'm actually gonna make this into a business I have to be honest it wasn't I I still don't think I had quite the right business head on so I started by rather than putting anything on my own website I launched on a freelancing site Mm -hmm. so I just went on a freelancing site and I I kind of thought of some things I could do for people so I could write their Amazon product descriptions so back in my corporate role I should say I did a lot of copywriting Mm -hmm. so I am a writer by background so that was a a real strength for me so that was one of the first things I offered Um, I also was very familiar with the Amazon advertising portal but now obviously I can do lots more things but back then there were certain key things I thought okay this is where I can really add value and so I listed them as as jobs on a freelancing site and I started to get people coming to me and booking work Um, I was getting really good reviews and in terms of revenue I'll be really honest at the beginning I didn't know how to price because Mm -hmm. It I, it I found it really hard because I'd when I was doing when I was teaching yoga I knew what I was charging because I, I you know you know what the going rate is you can do some research into okay this is what people pay to go for a class maybe they'll pay a bit less if they're you know they're paying for a term or whatever it is um and when I was selling products I obviously did lots of research into you know what I should price them at but with services I found it really tricky because at the time there weren't a lot of people doing what I wanted to do and I really had no idea of how of how to price and what I basically did is I kind of went okay how long is this going to take me and if I'm going to be working x amount of hours how much money do I want for that and I massively underpriced everything um some advice I heard lately that again might be useful to anyone offering services is that rather than charging just for your time there should also be a certain amount of profit margin on top of that because obviously you're providing a service a transformation um and it's it's not just about the time you're spending you're obviously offering what you should be offering some sort of business uh, benefit to that person who has hired you for the work so as well so for example as well as by writing someone's product description not only have you saved them time you've done a really professional job hopefully that product description is going to get them sales and make them more money so that was advice I was given by a coach um, that really helped me to reevaluate that because when I started I don't think I had the confidence to ask for very much for what I was doing and I I saw it on as a very transactional basis Mm. Um, but then I learned to realize that actually if you're doing a good job you're providing more than just the service you're actually really providing a transformation for someone's business potentially yeah yeah okay that's that's good then so 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 tell us more about um how if somebody wants to start a business right now let's say they are thinking about selling a product on amazon or any other e-commerce platforms we have available how should they start what are the prerequisite they have to do in order to first put the money into the bank account where they buy the product? Okay, well, the first thing I would say is I don't think there's any prerequisite, and I think it's useful for people to know in terms of your background, your experience. Um, you, you don't need to have a key set of skills or anything like, like that. Um, I don't believe there's that barrier. I think the, the thing you need to have, though, is a good product idea because... As, as you know, there are so many products, businesses, so many products. If your product doesn't have something special or unique about it to make it stand out, it's going to be really hard. To, it's going to be really hard to sell. So, I, I, yeah, that for me is the, is the first thing. You need to have a really good idea. And that shouldn't just be you also thinking it's a really good idea. You need to spend the time doing the research before you put any time and money in. The things you need to look at is what else is on the market that's similar to your idea, how unique is your product. Um, if you're going for a product category where there, you know, there are 
other similar products out there how will yours be different i would mm. i would get really familiar with other similar products what the features are how much the the price i would be looking at the reviews especially on amazon amazon's great for reviews what do other people like about these products what don't they like all data so that you can make yours the best you possibly can and then i would also be speaking to potential customers i would be thinking who might want to buy my product what kind of person um how would it help them or benefit them in some way and i would find those people and i would speak to them and i would get as much information as i could to feel satisfied that actually if I do decide to go ahead with this product and put the time and money in, one, there's fit in the market, there is a place for it, and two, people are actually going to buy this. I mean, of course, you know, you still have to put work into making sure when you do create it, it's a great product, and you have to think about how you position it and the marketing, um, but you need to get these fundamentals first. All right. Okay, great. So let's say let's say a hypothetical situation i decided to sell something on uh, amazon or what should i say a mic a podcast mic right podcast mics are really expensive they charge they cost you 250 260 pounds for one unit um so i go there I do my research i speak with the customers i see the reviews on amazon um everything uh, and I, I remember from a very, very far memory, I have attended a class somewhere um, in West London for Amazon uh, back in, I think, to, to 2018 or something. They used to refer it. Uh, it there's a tool called Camel, Camel, Camel or something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So did that research. Everything has happened. What are the next step I should follow? Okay, so once you've kind of done that, and let's say you've let's say you've done all of this, and you've gone, okay, I know what the product is that I want to create. Let's say, and you've got a very good idea. There's two things I want you to do. One is to actually have a full specification for your product. So actually, think about what it is, what it consists of, all of the things that make your product your product. Um, and the other thing I would want you to do is think about the pricing. And it may seem like an early stage. For you to be thinking about how you price your product not everyone will agree with me on this but i believe that you should think about how you're going to price your product before you even go and find out how much it'll cost to produce and the reason i think this is if you price your product based on where it fits in the market so is it high end is it lower end and you'll go you're looking at other products and you're thinking okay realistically if this product sells for x and this product sells for y where does mine fit what can I reasonably charge for this? Um, if a customer says to me, oh, why is it this price? I, you can confidently say it's because it has these features or because of whatever it is. Um, and then you go and look to get it manufactured. If you find out for any reason that actually the manufacturing costs mean that there won't be any margin or enough margin, you can then sort of revisit your idea. You can say, okay, well, maybe I could change this or which will bring the production cost down, but possibly I'll have to charge less. Or you could say, okay, I was going to get it manufactured in the UK, but maybe I'll look somewhere else to see if I can get better prices. If you go out and you look for production prices and then you say, okay, I'm going to put a, let's say 20% margin on top and that's how much I'm going to sell it for, you could be completely missing the mark. Mm -hmm. And when you price that way, it's very hard if customer says to you, oh, that's very expensive you can't really go back and say, oh yeah, because it cost me a lot of money to make because most people don't, you know, they don't care about that. They want the price to make sense. If, if you look on Amazon in particular, as you'll know, anything you search for on Amazon, you get a list of products. Mm. You, you might not necessarily buy the cheapest, but you're not going to buy the most expensive. Say podcast mic as an example, mm. you're not going to buy the most expensive podcast mic if you compare it to another one and you say, okay, this is the same spec, does the same things, but this one's 50 pounds more. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're not going to pay that just because it's the most expensive. You would, to pay 50 pound more, you would want to see it had something different, something unique. It had, there would have to be a reason to justify that. So yeah, that's yeah. the reason I suggest pricing. And, and I wouldn't even pay the, I, I wouldn't even buy the cheapest one because I want it to be good. No. 
you know so like on amazon if i see oh there is a mic which is podcast mic that's for 17 or 20 pounds but there is a mic which is like for 300 pounds why and then i'm gonna look and see the reviews and quality because people do post a lot of video reviews nowadays and then i realize oh the quality of the 300 pounds mic is really really good i want that quality but i don't have that much money or i don't want to spend that much money so what are the options so then i'll go in the middle okay so in our hypothetical situation we did that we realized that okay there is a mic selling for 300 pounds uh, i don't care about where i'm going to produce or manufacture my mic but i think that i should sell it for i don't know 150 which is where you know i put my product right then I reach out to uh, some providers, some manufacturers, and figure out okay, the mic could I could get the mic for 130 pounds, but that just leaves me a 10 pounds margin on top of it, which is very very low. But it still makes me some profit after paying Amazon fee and etc. Advertising and everything. Should I proceed with it? Should I not? Because it's very low margin, right? And then the ultimate goal is to make money, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Ideally, probably not. I, in that situation, I think there's two options. One is try, well, there's a few options. One would be to try and negotiate with the supplier to get it for a lower price. Mm -hmm. The second thing would be to think, is there anything more I can do that justifies me selling for, let's say, for example, £160 rather than £150? And I can't say, because obviously every situation is different, I can't say what that thing would be, but it might be, is there some way we can is there something else we can add that maybe will only cost, let's say, two or three pounds more, but justifies me putting ten pound, fifteen pound on the price? Could it be that we brand or package it much nicer? So, let's say, for example, we've looked on Amazon and everyone says, "Oh, my mic arrived damaged because the packaging wasn't very good. The you know the box fell apart." So, um, you know, is it? Is it, is it something like that? We say, okay, well, our USP can be that we're packaged this really nicely. Can you include something extra? So, for example, let's just say, can you include, this is off the top of my head, but I don't know, could you include a cloth bag for carrying your microphone in and that costs 50p to purchase? But could you, for that small purchase, say it's, a, it's, a, it's unique, we put another five pound on the product price. So this is all obviously yeah. hypothetical because it obviously depends on the situation. Yeah. Um, for some people, they might say, actually, it's okay. Um, it's okay, I don't make much margin initially. I will order a first batch. I will market, I'll get some sales, I'll get some reviews. And then I'll put, the, you know, with a long-term view of putting the price up. So some people yeah. do take that approach. But, but I think... It's maybe about being a bit creative about where can you either save money without obviously skimping or where can you add some value without necessarily adding a lot more to your production price. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So so I'm just thinking from a from from a founder's you know mindset because I always think like that. So there you go. Found a found a mic. I, uh, my manufacturing is giving me for 140 pounds and I have added this cloth and the new packaging and I'm now pricing it for 160 instead of 150. Now that my profit margin has increased by 20, 20 pounds, right? Now, when it comes to order and get, let's say my provider is in China, when it comes to order and get the order shipped to Amazon Fulfillment Center, what are the due diligence I should be doing what kind of things I should be making sure before putting these, I don't know, 10,000 pounds on the table? Well, first of all, I would, before you even think about placing an order, I would do lots of research into the supplier, um, mm. the manufacturer. I know that for lots of people, myself included, it's not possible to get on a plane and go to, and go to China. That was never a I've never been able to do that with any supplies I worked with. That just wasn't an option. Um, mm. But you can have Zoom calls with them to see them, you know, to actually have face-to-face -face interaction, get shown around the facility. You can pay for a private inspection. So you can, you could, there are companies where someone will go on your behalf. They'll take videos, they'll take photographs 
of of the facility lots of them now will have um certifications to say things like you know about environmental policies about how staff are treated um and so for example if you use alibaba as a site to find manufacturers a lot of that information is on there you can also get product level inspections so once your product has been manufactured you can agree you know you can hire someone who will go along and depending on the product maybe they're going to inspect just the finished product but maybe they go and inspect different stages um, I would always recommend getting a sample. So before you go for a big batch production, I would always recommend getting one sample produced. That can be expensive, but often you can negotiate for the cost of that to be taken off the final production price. Mm. Um, and even if that means getting it shipped from China to the UK, yes, it will take a little bit of time, but I think it's really worth it for you to see the product. And yeah. the final yeah. thing I would say as well is it if you're going to do all of this still at the very end don't get them all shipped directly into amazon um mm. i never really i never recommend that unless you have no other option for two reasons one is that you want to check obviously they've been they're going from china to the uk personally i like to have some sort of check have they arrived have they all arrived have they arrived okay um are they still in good condition i want to whether that's you personally or whether you use a third party fulfillment check it and that um and the second thing would be i never recommend sending hundreds of units into amazon if you can avoid it because usually when you look at amazon fulfilling your orders the shipping price often is comparable to you doing it yourself it's usually not so expensive um the storage side can get expensive if you're sending in a lot of stock and it doesn't move quickly enough and of course there's no guarantee of that that can get expensive so I always recommend if you can, don't send it all into Amazon. Have a sort of intermediary, whether it's a fulfillment center, whether it's your garage, your spare room. Um, I know that's not ideal, but, you know, this can change. Um, but especially for your first order, I would want to, to see it and check that it's as I expected because, yeah, it's, it's a, you're spending a lot of money and you're putting a lot of faith even if you've done all your due diligence I feel like at every step of the way you need, need to be making checks that you've got what you expect and what you paid for okay so few quick burning questions then sure um, how much duty we have I have to pay on these imports do you have like a spreadsheet or or a blog post somewhere which can tell us, okay, electronic product has this much duty, fruit product has no duty, baby product has duty. I, I don't have that because you can get that from the government website. Um, and also I, my other advice would be if you are importing anything, it's, I, I've never done it myself. I've always worked with a freight forwarding company, a, always a UK-based company to deal with that side of things for me. So you can pay a company, a shipping company, to collect your goods, to bring them over to the UK using the method you choose. They can help you with the paperwork that's needed with the duty payments. And of course you're paying them to do this, but I think it's well worth it to make sure that you're compliant. Okay, okay. I think this next one is how much it costs to store things in Amazon fulfillment and how much they charge other than storage to deliver it to your customers, percentage wise, or if you know on top of your head i'll be honest again i don't know because it, there's um it really depends on the size of the product and the weight of the product determines how much you pay this is mm -hmm. all on the amazon website but what i can provide you with ash for the show notes for this episode if you feel it would be useful mm -hmm. is there's actually a calculator it's a free tool it's created by amazon where you can put all the details of your product so what mm -hmm. the product is what category what the size is what the weight is how much you'll be selling it for and they will work out all the fees for you so the shipping fees the storage fees and the percentage fee that you pay per sale so if I send oh. you that could be quite a useful resource as I say it's free people can play around with it and just get a feel for what kind of fees they might be expecting amazing yeah that would be great so yeah I would I would add that to into this episode okay so I think the third question for me on this one is let's say you have the product delivered to yours let's say I have got 100 mics right it's sitting in my garage. I have sent 20 of them to Amazon Fulfillment. It's there and I'm hoping that it will be sold out in the next six months, etc. 
and yeah everything is automated now you know i don't have to do anything except looking at amazon my listing and getting it sold out um what things i need to make sure at that point of time while my what? product is for example do i have to reply each and every review or do i have to make sure that if somebody buys it i talk to them personally one to one or what kind of things i have to make sure while it's happening in on a automation to be honest there's not there's not really a lot that you need to do at all um so amazon will do all the communication with customers so they will send so you'll know when you've bought something on amazon you get the email saying thank you for your order then you'll get the email it's been shipped it's been delivered um all of that amazon does for you years ago i would have said you know set up your own automated emails to ask for reviews and feedback um now 99% of customers opt out of emails from third parties it's not really even worth bothering if I'm being very blunt um, mm-hmm. because I don't know when you last got an email asking some to review something on Amazon it's probably because you've opted out of these um, so I wouldn't say you need to do that you will have to deal with any queries so if a customer most of the time most 99% mm-hmm. of queries will be dealt with by Amazon but you might get the odd customer who wants to ask you something directly and you'll get notified of this People can also ask questions on your product listing. So you've probably seen the question and answer section on Amazon product listings before. So they are populated by real customer questions. If someone asks you a question, you obviously want to provide a response. Again, you'll be notified when this happens. You do want to look at your reviews. You definitely don't need to reply to them, but I would keep an eye on them. Reason being is if you get a review that you feel is totally unfair so let's say so amazon are doing your shipping let's say you get a one star review because amazon um puts the package in somebody's dustbin and the bin men take it away and the customer gets very cross and they go on your listing and say this is terrible well that's not your fault that that's not about the product that's not even about you as a seller and when that kind of thing happens you can go to amazon and say look i've got this one star review it's not justified and they will remove it but they won't do that unless you notify them so keeping an eye on your reviews is really is really important what people often don't realize is you also get what they call seller reviews so that's a product review so what you see on the product page is a product review but if you look at any product on amazon and you click on the name of the seller you can also see their seller feedback rating and again right. this is where people like to complain about my order was late or whatever it is the packaging was damaged again that feedback shouldn't reflect on you so if you get that sort of feedback you need to be flagging it and you don't need to be doing this daily you can do once a week it's going to take you less than five minutes keep on top of it the other thing to keep on top of is is your inventory so you might have sent these 20 in and you might think it's going to last six months but actually maybe they're selling quicker than you expected in which case you want to think about sending stock in. You always have to bear in mind that depending on the time of year, it can take from a week to maybe even two to three weeks for your stock to go from leaving your garage to being on the shelf at Amazon. Particularly now, as we're recording, we're coming up to Christmas, the warehouses get busier. It takes them longer to get your boxes off the van, open them up, scan everything in, make it available for sale. So it's always worth keeping an eye on what stock you've got I'm thinking ahead of okay I'm thinking about these key events so right now I'm suggesting to businesses now is a good time if especially if your product is one that you see an increase in sales before Christmas um now is a good time to start thinking okay how much stock do I need to send me through till January and sending that in ahead of time but other than that and then the final thing I'll say actually sorry because I said there was nothing but there are a few things if you're running any advertising on Amazon please don't set up ads and just leave them running, check in on them, even if it's once a week, and just check that they're working for you. Got it. Got it. Okay, great. So I guess I've got all the information to start a business on Amazon now. For, for, for my <laughs> podcast. <laughs> my <God. laughs> That's well, there's great. one thing I um Can I just add one more thing that I haven't mentioned? I probably should. Would you mind? Yeah, yeah sure. It's because I haven't said it, so I should say it, is that, The final thing I haven't touched on is that when you are setting up on Amazon, make sure you do a really good job because as you'll see when you're browsing, 
most of the time now listings are really well written um what you may not know as a customer is they'll be optimized for S amazon seo so as well as being really engaging and talking about all the benefits of the product they'll also be very well optimized so they come up in search in the first place you'll see that the good product listings they have great images they have really good graphics and if i'm advising someone starting on amazon now i say your listing needs to be at this level because mm -hmm you know, it's, it's becoming more competitive every day. So, you know, the amount of new, I forget the numbers, but the amount of new sellers joining on a daily basis is getting harder and harder. And you, you can't just add in a few bullet points of a couple of words and expect that anyone will find your product, let alone buy it. So I'm sorry if that's really obvious, but I think it's, it's still it's worth saying. Point. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Great stuff. So we are approaching towards the end of our interview. So I would like you to take you through the lightning round where I've got some questions for you so you can answer them as quickly as possible. You ready? Yeah, ready. Great. What book would you recommend to our audience and why? Um, can I say my own book? <laughs> I wrote a book. I'm going to say my own book. I'm sorry. This feels like such a shameless plug. I released a book this year. It's called Bring Your Product Idea to Life. And it takes you through the entire product creation process step by step. So it goes into a lot of detail about what you need to do, when, in which order. Um, so I, if you've enjoyed listening to me, I'd recommend the book. Definitely. Definitely. What one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful founder? I think resilience. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of um, guests I have uh, interviewed on the show and they, they stick to this word. That's really good. What one of what's one of the best piece of business advice you have received? Um, oh, this is really hard. I've received so much. Okay. I'm going to go for one that I've received. And I mentioned this earlier. It's one I heard actually really recently, which is about think about the transformation you're offering someone, not just a trans, not just a transaction, but the transformation. Transformation. Yeah, I agree. Agree. What's your favorite personal, personal productivity tool or habit? I think for me, it's a habit and it's consistency. So if I, want to do something i do it every day i find yeah, um okay yeah yeah great and last but not least what's a new or a crazy business idea you would love to pursue if you had the time oh that's really tricky um if i had the time well this is this is yeah this is um, well, I, I won't mind telling you, I'll be honest, this is my daughter's idea, not mine, but I'm totally on board is we quite like the idea of running a hotel for, for pets. So rather than like a, rather than like a kennels somewhere that feels actually like a holiday for the animal. Yeah. Well, you know what? I went to Canterbury the other day and there was a cat cafe and it was fully booked for three weeks. So it is definitely a good idea. Oh, that's good to know. <laughs> Hey, Vicky, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your story and backing last, uh, you know, years of building this uh, amazing business and your coaching uh, consulting services and some of the ups and downs along the way. If people want to check out or connect with you, what's the best way? So the best place to go is my website, which is vickyweinberg.com. And of course, that will hopefully be in the show notes so that I won't I won't spell it out. And um, for anyone who's interested in my book, it's called Bring Your Product Idea to Life, which is the same as my podcast. And they're both available via Amazon, as you would probably expect. Awesome. Awesome. Vicky, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your inspiring journey and the impactful work you're doing. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Founders Podcast. Thank you so much, Ash. Thank you all for tuning into our episode on our Founders Podcast. I hope you found our conversation with Vicky insightful and inspiring. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to our podcast and stay updated on future interviews with proven founders and industry experts. We have a lineup of incredible guests and valuable insights coming your way. Stay inspired, stay motivated, and keep building.